the other side. The powers of the human mind may be infinite. And many believe you can unleash these powers on the process of healing, making it possible to literally think yourself well. Incredible? Some people who have managed to save their own lives are here to share their incredible stories today on the other side. Welcome back to the other side. Is your mind the most powerful drug known to medicine? Joining us is a physician who has an answer to that question and a book to go along with it. Dr. Gerald Epstein is the author of Healing into Immortality. Dr. Epstein, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. Um, now, you're a physician and a psychiatrist. Yes, uh, you've right. heard these kinds of stories before. This is not unusual to no, you. No, this is... Uh, uh, I personally participated in hundreds of uh, healing uh, healings along this way, and I've taken people through healing processes for innumerable amounts of the numbers of illnesses, all the way from acne and warts to cancer and phobia and depression and you name it. Now, so when we... Uh, it's we a miracle. Okay. Well, sometimes people, we, hear, we, we sort of have to distinguish. When we hear healing, sometimes we think about, you know, like a laying on of hands and then you're healed. But what we're healing as we're describing it today is you have the power to participate in your recovery from whatever is ailing you. Right. so that you can heal right. alongside with traditional medicine. Well, this is, this is nothing new because we've had a 5,000-year tradition in the West of this kind of medicine. It's a mind-body medicine that's really coming back into, uh, into fashion, uh, and we've had it all, these, all this time. And what I'm doing is teaching people to use the mind, which has always been with us, to uh, understand how it's used and to use it to heal yourself. You have to know how to use it to heal yourself physically and emotionally. And we teach that. Now, you've heard Donna and Angela's uh, story. Medically, what's going on with them, overcoming Epstein-Barr and breast cancer? Yes, they've, uh, in the mind-body unit, in the mind-body system, the mind it has a powerful effect on healing the body. We know about the body's effect on the mind, and we know that, that, that physical pills, for example, can alter the mind. We can also alter the body, and we can also alter emotional states by using uh, the mind. And uh, uh, Angela's story is like the story of Job. It, uh, the biblical stories have a lot to teach us about healing. And she had a Jobian life. Everything was taken from her. And she never mm -hmm. lost her faith in God. She always heard the still small voice. And no matter what happened, she came back and, uh, and lived. Even and Job's, really wife, even Job's wife uh, said, don't just give it up and die. So right. Did, did you Everybody. feel like Job? That's yes. beautiful. And in fact, I did read the book of Job yes. during this time. Yes. And I looked for an answer in that book, yes. and I found one because the, the tragedy did not stop in Job's life until the Lord said to him, you have not yet said to me the right thing. Right. And the right thing was, I surrender my will. I surrender my will mm. to the will of God. He never lost his faith in that uh, still small voice, that voice of God. What, is your, what is your prescription for uh, Well, I have, a, a, in, in, and I really... Uh, teach people and detail it very uh, strongly and clearly in the book uh, that there are a number of things you can do. One is that you need to find a, a higher power or God, uh, that you have to have faith in yourself, and that you uh, have to use uh, your own power for uh, healing and to be loving to yourself and to others. And uh, find your, uh, and participate. You have to participate mm -hmm. directly in your own illness. What happened here uh, in the stories that we've heard is that they participated directly in their own healing and didn't surrender themselves to an external authority. They became their own authority, and that's really mm -hmm. essentially what's going on here. It sounds reminiscent to me of what I've heard people who are in recovery, 12-step recovery programs, talk well, you, about that. You, but you uh, know that a story that's uh, somewhat similar to Angela's, that Bill Wilson, the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, was in a flop house. And he was at the, and he was a physician, and he was an alcoholic, and he was in the Bowery, in Manhattan, and he, and he fell down on the floor one day and prayed for help from God and the, and the guidance, and uh, to be, and to be saved. He was dying, and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous came out of that incident in the 12-step mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. Dr. Epstein, what do your medical colleagues think of you and your work? Well, it's been an interesting odyssey. Twenty years ago. Uh, they um, would not hear of this, wouldn't go anywhere near it, and uh, wouldn't touch me with a hundred-foot pole. And uh, they told their patients, if they, patients would come and say to them, they're going to see me, they'd say, he's a charlatan and a quack and don't do that. Well, today, I'm teaching in medical centers, I'm at, at medical conferences, uh, doctors are referring patients to me, uh, doctors and other oral health professionals come to me for training, I have a training
Training Center. And uh, to cap it all off, I got a grant from the National Institute of Health to do research on the use of imagery and asthma at a leading hospital in New York City, and we're conducting that research right now. Interesting to me, it's the almost, there's almost an irony here that in some diseases where Western medicine has failed people, it's almost as if the doctor has to surrender and say, I give up before they'll accept some alternatives. Well, I think you see in the case of, um, uh, of uh, Angela, where she had the eight mammograms, and she, he, she came and told the, when she told the story, I started to cry. Because, and I cried for one reason, that she uh, told the doctor, uh, they did the eight mammograms, and he came and he said, what, what happened? And she told the story, and he said, well, if you want to think it's birds eating crumbs and uh, all of that, whatever you want, you're a lucky woman. And he didn't uh, have the, the capacity at the moment to open himself up. In the 20 years I've been doing this work, and patients have come, and as you'll hear a little later on, have healed from all sorts of illnesses. Not one doctor in 20 years ever called me to find out what happened. Mm -hmm. I've seen, mm -hmm. you know, the person had a cyst, it's disappeared. They had a tumor, it's gone. They have ulcerative colitis, it's gone. What happened? What did mm -hmm. you do? Mm -hmm. And so on. What, and nobody's ever taken, and I think that medicine is beginning maybe a little bit to open up to mm -hmm. find out what did we do. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Epstein, do you still practice conventional medicine? I would say that my, my medicine is a traditional medicine. It's a 5,000-year-old medicine. What I've done <laughs> is reestablish <laughs> the link mm -hmm. of the original medicine that we've had for the 5,000 years, and that came under a cloud for the last few centuries. But it's always been the way that we've had, and that's the traditional medicine. I generally call the medicine that's practiced now conventional medicine, and I think it has some role, uh, uh, some role to play. But uh, <coughs> this it ha it has a vast uh, uh, application, a tremendous application. It is okay. the tradition of the Western life. Dr. Epstein, what made you change from your belief in conventional Western medicine to this? Yeah, because you were trained originally just as a I was trained as a physician, here. as a psychiatrist, as a psychoanalyst. I had all the full training. And I had the good fortune to meet a guide, uh, a real-life guide, who, uh, and in the meeting with her, I had a, an awakening experience, a spiritual awakening, in the first five minutes of the meeting. And I changed my whole course, my whole point of view, and I understood that I came to understand from that meeting that our thoughts can, uh, by our thoughts and our mind, we can um, fulfill what we are meant to be, we can get, we can, uh, uh, get what we need, uh, mm -hmm. And we can use our minds to heal ourselves of our uh, illnesses and, and our is, maladies. This is sounding less and less uh, uh, esoteric and eccentric as years go by. I mean, but, well, you see, if you don't know the history, if we don't know our history, we're going to be, we're, we often may pay a price mm -hmm. for it. The history of Western medicine is a mind-body medicine. And the glitch came 350 years ago in that. And what we're doing is reestablishing the link of 5,000 years. It was always a mind-body medicine. And that's what Angela and Donna have tapped into, the mind and its mm -hmm. possibilities the, the, and our own being. And, and it's not only the mind as, as, as some kind of a thing that is apart from us. It's what's happening in your life, like Dr. Epstein or met somebody that elicited a change in him. And this is what happens to us. We meet people. We cross paths with people. And if you allow yourself to open in love to you that experience. You can have experience, a healing encounter. It yes. happens to everybody who wants it. Everybody who exactly. wants it, it will come. Okay. The universe will give it to you. Well, can you simply refuse to allow your body to become sick? When we come back, we're going to meet a man who fought death to a draw with some good advice from his doctor, advice he'll share with you when the other side returns. Welcome back to The Other Side. Our next guest knows what it's like to face death. Diagnosed with incurable prostate cancer, he was told by his doctors to prepare for the worst. Instead, High Anzo got a new doctor and decided to take his life into his own hands. And the rest is really a medical miracle. I, uh, hi, hi, I'm sorry to say oh. that. That's <laughs> hello, hi. Uh, when were you diagnosed, Hi? Oh, first of all, I want to mention that I'm 71 years old, so... <laughs> There's still plenty of time for everybody. <laughs> I, was, uh, I went to see a urologist uh, when I had a very high PSA, which is a blood sample, which has numbers that denote whether you're in trouble. For with prostate uh, cancer. With prostate cancer. One to four being normal. Mine was 24, which also indicated it may have spread through my body. At any rate, I went to this urologist, 
and um, he examined me, found a hard P-shaped, si P-shaped size tumor, which he thought was malignant, but would not know until he did the biopsy, which we did, and the biopsy uh, came out uh, to contain a very highly aggressive cancer, not the slow-moving type that are sometimes found, and it was a, a Gleason scale nine, the highest being 10. So it was also a, a very um, poorly differentiated cancer. Was you see how you're talking? Can you relate to that? Have you ever had anyone sick in your family? You suddenly become a medical expert yourself on this. Oh, I did, I did a lot of PSAs. I did a and, lot of work. And I even have the first biopsy report, which they may show you on camera. It shows that the my prostate was just riddled with cancer. The next thing I heard from this doctor was that if I don't treat it, I would have about two years to live because of its aggressiveness. I then began to see other doctors, and the news kept getting worse. The next doctor looked at some x-ray and uh, said, I, you're in bad shape because I can see that it's no question that it's uh, left your prostate. How long do I have? I don't know, maybe three months or six months. I, I have no way of knowing. To live. That's so what you're on, so yeah, how long do I have to live? The last doctor, which was the head urologist at Sloan Kettering, uh, sent a letter back to this one doctor saying that uh, I'm not a candidate for an operation nor radiation because there's no question in his mind that I have metastasis, distant metastasis of the cancer throughout my body. My ex-wife suggested then, why don't you try visualization? I said, well, I don't know what that is. And I went and got a book, and there are about two books on the whole thing. And the one I got was written by Dr. Repstein. I started looking through it, through the exercises. And then I came to the one on cancer, and I called Dr. Repstein and wanted him to put me through the paces or give me some exercises. I went to him for a series of three visits, and um, visualization consisted of uh, <clears throat> about three times a day, just sitting with your eyes closed, taking a breath and, you know, relax yourself, and using your imagination to, in my case, enter my body to where the prostate was, and go to work and see what was there, and of course, what I found in the one lo uh, lobe of the prostate was a lumpy, clayish-like substance which looked like a, a tumor. Now, let's just get this clear. In other words, yeah. in your visualization, you visualize that you are actually entered your own body, you're at the prostate, and you are seeing the cancer in your own right. prostate. And with the guidance of Dr. Epstein, he said mm -hmm. you have a light to get around, and you should tear that tumor apart and put it in a bag that you have, which I did. Like tear the cancer away. Right, and I ripped it apart. I went to the next lobe, and there was another one that, now this is imagination. We're getting close to it, right? Well, I did the other one, exited my body, and uh, uh, burned the, uh, the uh, cancer specimens at Dr. Epstein's uh, uh, suggestions into ashes and then buried them. Now, I did this for a period of about eight weeks, uh, three times a day for three weeks and then one week off. My imagination, of course, increased in, in some of the explorations I made with these cells. I began even to talk to some of them. Mm -hmm. To the cells? Uh, you began to, to talk some to of the cells? cells, the healthy cells. Mm -hmm. One of them even one day jumped up and kissed me on the cheek and said, you're okay. <laughs> and there were more things like that. And I said, aren't I superimposing my own imagination to make these things happen? Dr. Epstein said, it's your imagination, that's what counts. Mm -hmm. So anyway, you go through eight weeks of this, yeah. and um, eight weeks of this visualization process. And this ended last year. And then you went back yeah. to have another test. Tell us about that. Uh, yeah, uh, well, Dr. Epstein said after eight weeks, you're finished. And I said, what do you mean I'm finished? He said, well, you're okay. I don't have to do anything. I said, well, I, I've got to take a biopsy. I want to mm -hmm. see the results. He 
you know, some proof. So I went back to my doctor and I took a biopsy and he uh, did it and uh, left for vacation and the nurse was going to give me the result and I asked her what she drank. She said, I drink uh, some fancy kind of vodka. And I said, well, if by luck uh, we have, a, a, you know, the right thing that I expect, you've got yourself a bottle of vodka. So the result, and it's right here, she calls me up and she says, you owe me a bottle of vodka. It's negative. There's nothing here. And my PSA since then, which was December 16th, has fallen down as, and I'm off any medicine, mm. and it's point, 0 0.5 or 000. This is now since December 13th.